Warning, chlorine and triphosphine are toxic and irritating. Dichloromethane, chloroform, and carbon tetrachloride are toxic. Phosgene is extremely toxic. Wear respirators when handling them and perform the experiment outside. Hi guys, here is MIH. Since my last failure, I've improved my apparatus at several key points, including changing from two small UV curing lamps to two strong UV light panels and introducing sufficient chlorine for complete chlorination. And this time I did it. The second successful amateur production of triphosgene, if we count Mr. Camolis as an amateur as well. But before I get to the experimental details, I'll briefly recap the safety concerns. As I mentioned in the last video, triphosgene isn't soluble in water and doesn't react with it, but in the presence of a water miscible solvent like ethanol or acetone, it immediately reacts with residual water and generates easily detectable levels of phosgene. In fact, during the cleanup of today's experiments, my eyes got irritated by phosgene several times, but I'm fine thanks to my respirator. I also used up a whole 500 ml of ethanol to really make sure that I wash off all traces of triphosgene on my apparatus, but apparently a very careful smell test tells that there are still some triphosgene left on some of them. So yeah, the cleanup of this synthesis is probably the most annoying part. At the end of the video, I'll propose a few directions for future optimization and hope to solve this. We start with the exact same apparatus as last time, as I found out that things work quite well, and the silicone stopper held decently against the triphosgene and carbon tetrachloride. Instead of fresh DCM, I'm going to use the carbon tetrachloride that we distilled over last time, so we don't have to add more chlorine to fully chlorinate the solvent, which would allow me to determine the minimum amount of chlorine needed to run the reaction properly. Since I'm using the same batch size of 18 grams of dimethyl carbonate and 50 mL of solvent, from calculations, only 92.8 grams of TCCA was needed, so I weighed out 100 grams and added it into my flask. I then weighed out a random amount of hydrochloric acid drain cleaner that I recently bought. Just from looking at it, it is obviously yellow, and from titration, I found that the concentration is roughly 6%. This impure and dilute acid can't be used for basically anything else, but it is fine for making chlorine gas. An interesting thing I noted was that the yellow impurity in the acid is sensitive to chlorine. The yellow color of the acid immediately fades when it touches either the CCCA powder or the chlorine gas, so it's probably an organic dye. I also poured more acid in my beaker for absorbing the hydrogen chloride generated. The reaction is started by dripping the acid on the TCCA as usual. It takes a while to displace all of the air inside the apparatus, and oxygen is a strong inhibitor to photocolytic chlorination, so I didn't immediately turn on the UV light. When I saw that the reaction mixture turns yellow from dissolved chlorine, I switched on my UV panels, and immediately you can see smokes forming in the flask and the condenser. The gas flow at the end also decreased quite a bit, as hydrogen chloride is now being produced and easily dissolves into the dilute acid. Soon, the reaction mixture turned colorless, and all the chlorine introduced reacted away. I wondered how fast this mixture can absorb chlorine, so I opened my dripping funnel to maximum and let a ton of acid drip on the TCA. Surprisingly, the reaction mixture still remained perfectly colorless, indicating that all chlorine immediately reacted. The one effect that can be observed is the significantly increased reflux rate, as this photolytic chlorination reaction is known to be highly exothermic. At this crazy reflux rate, the condenser will soon be overwhelmed, so I had to turn down the chlorine production to a more reasonable rate. I also added a fan to continuously blow air on the UV panels and the flask and keep them cool, since I found that the panels got very hot after only a few minutes. The first 250ml of acid was all added in, and I reloaded the funnel with another 250ml. The first two thirds of the chlorination is very easy, and chlorine can be introduced very rapidly. The only thing to watch out is controlling the reflux rate in the condenser and not letting it overload. The beaker containing the acid also started to get warm, as hydrogen chloride dissolves exothermically in water. The chlorination was rather uneventful, and I just add all of the acid at a rather fast rate. A third 250ml portion of acid was also added in to ensure an excess of acid to TCA and liberating all of the chlorine gas. After the gas generation stopped, the mixture in the flask is still crystal clear, showing that we need more chlorine. I then refilled the generator with another 100 grams of TCCA, but apparently the mixture still continued to absorb chlorine. I did one final load of 60 grams of TCCA, and only after a little bit of chlorine addition, the mixture retained a light yellow color, and didn't disappear even after 2 minutes of irradiation without more chlorine introduced. This means that the chlorination is finally over. 
In total, I spent around 210 grams of TCCA and a liter of the 6% hydrochloric acid to completely chlorinate the 18 grams of dimethyl carbonate and hopefully make 50 grams of triphosgene. This is honestly quite a lot of TCCA, but the hydrochloric acid consumption can be probably be cut down by recycling the acid in the absorption beaker. My next goal is to optimize these figures and find the cheapest and most efficient way to mass produce triphosgene. Anyways, if the flask is inspected closely, crystals of triphosgene can be seen on the walls of the flask, at the bottom, and even inside the gas inlet tube. This shows that 50 mL of carbon tetrachloride is the bare minimum amount of solvent, as the small amounts of solvent will result in triphosgene crystallizing out and blocking the gas inlet tube. I then rearranged the apparatus for distillation to remove the solvent. As you can see, this step was quite messy, as the triphosgene easily crystallized on the joints of the adapters when the solvent quickly evaporated. Needless to say, the disassembled apparatus should be thoroughly washed with ethanol to get rid of the triphosgene. This time, I used around 500 mL of ethanol, and I hope to use much less of it in the future by running the reaction repeatedly at a larger scale, so the glassware only needs to be cleaned once. The distillation was quick, and after 30 minutes, some syrupy, slightly yellow liquid was left in the flask. Pure triphosgene is colorless, but the flask had some tar at the bottom which colored the triphosgene, but that is only minimal. I heated it up with the help of insulation to remove the last traces of solvent and allow the flask to cool down to roughly 80 degrees C. Triphosgene solidifies at 71 degrees C, so I quickly poured the liquid triphosgene into a plastic bottle for storage. The triphosgene rapidly crystallized in the bottle as small needles instead of large chunks, so it doesn't need to be remelted and poured out when we use it next time. The final yield of triphosgene was 52.07 grams or 87.7%. The slightly low yield probably results from residual triphosgene sticking in the glassware, but honestly, I'm pretty happy with this amount. I'll continue to work on this process to optimize it further. See you soon!